Hoping for complete denuclearization, the White House announcing today that President Trump and Kim Jong-un will hold a second summit next month after the commander-in-chief sat down with a top North Korean official earlier today. Joining us now is Zudi Jasser, American Islamic Forum for Democracy founder and president. Thank you for joining us. Um, since this was announced, I've already heard so much criticism from people saying they had the other summit, nothing came of it. Um, that, you know, North Korea hasn't delivered on the original promises or, or even laid out where all of their weaponry is. So why do it again? How would you respond to it? Do you think that that kind of criticism makes sense or is it not well founded? It doesn't make sense, Melissa, because you look at the last decades, uh, none of the pre preceding presidents have made actually the progress that we've made. Now, how much progress have we made? Many of the private studies in the past few months have said that they're still continuing to build up their missiles and, and uh, some of their uh, armamentarium, so there hasn't been any retraction. However, if you listen to the uh, critics back last year, they thought we were on the verge of nuclear war. They thought the belligerence was uh, uh, pathological, and yet that probably pushed them to an area Add on top of that, I think the tariffs uh, against the Chinese and others have caused them to not want to blink with the North Koreans and give them a bypass of sanctions, I think has played a huge role in bringing the North Koreans to the table. The meetings in November, Melissa, were canceled. Why? Because they wanted sanction relief. And when they saw it wasn't going to come with before the meeting, they canceled it. But now they're going to meet. So I think we're making progress diplomatically. Realistically, we haven't seen it yet, but the belligerence has gone away. All of the saber rattling that the left was worried about didn't seem to happen now a year later. So I think we're making progress more than we have ever in the past. How do you tell the difference between being at the table and being sort of played and, you know, led along? Because that's you're looking at the situation and one side sees it as now everybody's come to the table and they're talking. The other side sees it as, you know, no progress, they're buying time or they're trying to win relief without getting it, giving anything up and that it's, you know, almost a step backwards. How, how, can you, how can you tell the difference from the outside if you're not pre-biased to one side or the other? Well, that's a great question. You sort of compare the deal that we had with Iran where we signed a bunch of things and uh, they continued to move forward and now we're finding out with this administration as information gets released that all the things we signed were, were not even true uh, in the reality and yet with this uh, with the North Korean situation, uh, what do we have to lose? We've had no agreement, and they're coming to the table, realizing that they want to get back some of the sanction relief. So it seems that we have all the cards, very little to lose. There's no previous agreement. So at the end of the day, you look where we're coming from, and you compare it to other countries that we're trying to push, like Iran, and we see actually more progress. Zudi, I, I mean, I want to get your take on the president's decision to withdraw U.S. troops from Syria. You were one of the very first people to come out and talk about this issue years and years ago, even before the Obama administration even drew that red line that they didn't end up living up to. I mean, you've been drawing people's attention to this issue for so long. What do you think? Well, I have to tell you, I, I'm a bit disappointed that it's a binary equation, that either we have absolutely no troops and America withdraws with a huge sucking sound of a vacuum on the border of Israel, where we let Russia, Iran, Hezbollah, ISIS, Turkey, which is a jihadist nation, go in, or we, we talk about it as if it's a major deployment. We had barely 2,000 special forces there. Americans have, we have forces in Somalia, a few hundred, and all over the world we do some special ops. And the return on investment, Melissa, for those few hundred troops was very high. And we lost four troops. Now we lost another few uh, uh, this week. And I think that's a sign that when America leaves, it will implode. At the end of the day, I have to tell you, just as, as you mentioned, we've talked about for years, yeah. that is going to implode with Hezbollah, Russia, Assad, ISIS, Turkey going in, and the Kurds who we're leaving vulnerable. They are the allies that are closest to us, second only to Israel in the region, and we are leaving them and abandoning them. And I think they're going to turn to Russia and Assad, and the region at some point is going to demand a much more major deployment rather than well, the few hundred troops quick, that we've had we, there. I mean, we're out of time, but what would be the end game then? If we don't leave now, when, when is the end for the U.S.? Well, the end game is a whack-a-mole program against terror. It's not going to be won militarily. You're right. This is not a military end game. The end game is a war against jihad over the next mm -hmm. generation, and we begin to go on the offense ideologically. It will not be won militarily, but the whack-a-mole will continue. We just had an ISIS mm -hmm. arrest in Georgia and in Arizona, so the war is continuing. Zudi, thank you for your perspective. Really appreciate it. Thank you.